Welcome back, Red Spotters, to another show here on the Red Spotlight Entertainment Podcast. I'm your host today, Alexis J. Soto, and I am joined by Mr. Peter Martinez, our resident cinephile here, who is all-knowing and who is always right and whose opinion should never be questioned or judged because he is always correct. Peter, how are you doing today? Was that a great intro or what? Could have been better. Um, oh, but, yeah, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> We're a long way from the death of hope. Um, <laughs> which, I mean, it did coincide with the death of Star Wars, uh, which will be opening pretty soon. Yeah, Can't yeah. wait for that. Uh, today, we have a long-awaited show that we have been teasing for just about, I want to say, three weeks now. And this is going to be the first episode in a three-episode series honoring the films and works of perhaps the face of cinema today, Martin Scorsese. Uh, who has been in the news lately because uh, of reasons that we've already discussed on this show and for reasons that I have long moved on from because I am quite fed up with the fact that people are this, I'm sorry, either out of touch or cannot read between the lines of what was being said. But the fact that Scorsese had to go to the lengths of writing an op-ed in the New York Times to clarify what he meant a month after those comments were, it's, it's honestly to me just I'm, I don't know why I, I'm even shell-shocked but I am about how people just completely missed everything he was saying in those comments and uh, it inspired like, yeah. us to discuss real cinema exactly you know um, sarcasm, sarcasm people let's not <laughs> start a war here but um, I knew from the minute that uh, Scorsese was in the news um, that I wanted to do something with him it, because Irishman is going to come out this month, actually, at the very end of this month. And so we're going to be doing our damnedest to get out this series right before Irishman. Uh, and I was just really inspired by the fact that we wanted to explore some new uh, areas of programming for the weekly shows because we get it. The news can be the news. And at some point we can be caught in this circle of saying the same thing over and over again. So to celebrate the films of Martin Scorsese is to celebrate film itself and cinema itself. And what's going to be the beauty about this particular series, um, as usual, I have been completely aloof when it comes to movies like these throughout my <laughs> entire life. And so the special kind of like uh, predicament that we're in is I am watching the grand or the vast majority of these movies for the first time ever. While of course, Peter, uh, has seen these for years and years and years. And so we're going to basically be doing a to-the-table-esque uh, version of it, but in a more... We're going to be covering a lot of terrain here. Uh, and in today's episode, we are covering uh, five films from the early part of Scorsese's career, starting off... Uh, it actually spans a decade, from 1973 to 1983. And the movies we'll be discussing today are Mean Streets, Taxi Driver... New York, New York, Raging Bull, and The King of Comedy, two of which I've actually been talking about quite a bit on this show whenever I've uh, been asked a question or been forced to comment on The Joker, um, that being The King of Comedy and Taxi Driver, and I'm sure that'll come up at some point during today's show. So, in honor of Scorsese and of The Irishman, here we go, and uh, Peter, let me just uh, start off by asking you um, just how you kind of discovered his films and just generally what you like about him in his movies. And then we'll get into all this. How he discovered his films. Um, uh, um, I don't, I'd say uh, my family, I like I remember uh, like the Godfather movies being a big thing with my family and watching them and talking to them about it a lot. And then of course, from that came like Goodfellas and, a, and <laughs> a lot of Scorsese's, um, gangster movies. Yeah. And I, I remember watching those at like a fairly young age. Um, not the rated R versions, but like the TV versions. Cause I okay, wasn't good. allowed to see rated R films. <laughs> yeah. But it was one of those things where it's like, oh shit, this is, this is great uh, cinema, 
<laughs> and just that being, I remember something with my family really liking those. Um, so the way I was really introduced to him was Goodfellas and loving that, that film. And then of course it's like, you realize, Oh, Martin Scorsese, like that's, that's a thing. That's a name with which, um, he is like to be revered as far as movie making so then of course every time you come across a film that says you know directed by martin scorsese it's like oh maybe i should check this out and then you watch it and then it's fantastic so then the next time you come across a film directed by martin scorsese oh maybe i should check this out <laughs> it's <laughs> one of those things um like i do distinctly being rem remember being introduced to goodfellas but then i think everything else uh, I kind of just found, um, like, but of course, like you hear, you hear names like Taxi Driver, um, Casino, and then a lot of the other ones, like Mean Streets was something I had to find. So was like the King of Comedy or New York, New York. There are some more obscure ones, obviously, but to be clear here for those that are not aware, but you should be aware, we're talking about one of the best filmmakers that's ever lived. Yeah. yeah. That's just a reality. Who, and because he's made some of the best films ever made. And what I've always loved about him is how they are so goddamn entertaining. Like there are some great filmmakers where they're fantastic filmmakers but you got to be in the mood to, to, to watch their films. You, you just, like you can't just pop it on and then just go with it. You got to be like, okay, am I in the mood to watch this film from, the, you know, it's that kind of feeling. Even the more I feel um, mainstream filmmakers, um, but with Mars Scorsese, like drop, just drop you in the middle of a film and it can be like a long scene and you're just enamored. There's something he just knows how to do with the camera, with the acting, with the writing, with the movement of everything involved where, you know, it could just be a guy sitting there and, and you're pulled in completely and you're a hundred percent entertained. And that's something I've noticed with all of his films. Like I could watch a five hour Martin Scorsese film and not feel the runtime at all. Um, and that's something I've always loved about him and his films. Cause to me, it's like, that's the mark of an amazing filmmaker. Cause that tells me everything you're including is necessary and it's necessary in an entertaining way. So yeah, I've I've loved Marty's films. You could like he's one of those filmmakers too where you can ask him about like basically any film ever in all of existence and he'll be like, "Oh yeah," and then just like start talking about that film. Except Marvel <laughs> apparently. Um which aren't well, films. well, come on, those aren't films. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, sorry, they're not cinema. But with everything else, yeah, that that's the way he is. So he's someone, like, if you love film, you have to admire him. Um, kind of like Quentin Tarantino, where he's able to make uh, films that are both extremely entertaining to the mainstream, but are so good. You know, even the, the snobbiest of film critics will be like, oh, come on, Martin Scorsese. Um, Which is hard to do. That's so hard to do. To please both ends of that spectrum, uh, that's basically impossible. Might as well go find the gold at the end of a rainbow. Like, no. <laughs> and we should note, look, I mean, the history that is taught in every film class, like Scorsese is among those uh, treasured hallowed halls of directors that came up when the studio system was all but gone in the 70s, uh, along with your George Lucas's, your Steven Spielberg's, your Brian De Palma's, your Francis Ford Coppola's. That was, he was part of that group of friends that, that legendary group of friends that the all squad. made it at the same time. The squad. <laughs> He's referencing the um, the AOC uh, Democratic Socialist uh, Squad, or I should say the well, the Progressive Squad. Um, but basically, that you're right, the, the the Film Squad, and that's kind of uh, where a lot of modern day cinema comes from. You know, they came and they shook everything up. They changed the game, and they're all different directors to an extent. Um, oh yeah, and with Scorsese. What I've always liked about him, even though I haven't seen really any of his movies, I've only maybe I've only seen one movie, 
years and years ago. But I've always known of him. And what I've always liked about him is his personality and his passion for film is always there in just about any question that he answers. Whether he'd be, I know he was part of the team with Spielberg uh, to restore Lawrence of Arabia. Um, and he had some wonderful commentary on the film and how much he loved it and everything else. I know, I think my, I want to say that my first memory of, of Scorsese, of like seeing his face and everything, was when he did that Apple commercial years and years ago when I think Siri was first a thing on the iPhone. If you don't remember, remember I don't that? remember that. No, that was a commercial. Um, yeah. Cause he had his like black frame glasses and everything. He's, he's also a funny guy. Um, oh, yeah. so it's like a personality like his makes an impression that you remember that. So I've always known of him and I've always known how respected he was and how, what a, what a giant he is in this industry. But I will say, um, looking at his, where I'm at right now, we're talking about just five movies today. I've seen now over 10 films of his, and I've yet to witness a film that wasn't at the very least very good or great. And that's at the bottom end of the spectrum, mind you. Um, This is somebody that understands the language of cinema in a way that um, I wouldn't even think I (laughs) could even, I mean, we were talking about levels of which I can't even find the words to describe what a pro he is at these things. Um, He's just a master. He's a master work at everything that he does. And honestly, watching these movies for the first time is really building a lot of the anticipation for The Irishman, which is by many uh, people considered to be the swan song. His for masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he's had several. Let's be yeah. real about that. He's had several. That's which... funny. That's one thing. Like looking up um, uh, the films, like just to get like a background on them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. There, a couple of them were like considered to be his greatest film and it's like it was like three different films that said that and yeah. it's like <laughs> okay <laughs> they're all considered to be his greatest films i'm not arguing but yeah well it's like i saw someone um on film twitter the other day saying that scorsese has made a masterpiece per decade mm-hmm. if we're looking at whether it be taxi driver in the 70s or Raging Bull in the 80s, Goodfellas in the 90s, The Departed in the 2000s, and apparently now Irishman in the 2010s. Yeah, like, <laughs> I was kind of just thinking, watching his films, like, with the whole Marvel thing and the whole drama with him, like, he he could be a much bigger dick than he's been. Because, yeah. oh, holy but shit, yeah. is he, he's not like, really being amazing. one, though. No, he's, he's not. not really. I mean, but that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, if he wanted to, he right. kind of could. I mean, Coppola was Coppola, the one that. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Coppola I mean, was weird. the one being that way. Right, right. Um, and and you can say like, well, I mean, come on, he's Coppola. He can he can do that shit. But I think even more so than Coppola, uh, if if like, uh, he wanted to be like a real dick and come out swinging, like I'm fucking Scorsese. He could like he has made masterpiece after masterpiece. But he's not that kind of guy. Um, so that I think that's that's just. He's never that been that kind of guy. About him. Yeah, right. I don't think he's, he's never ever been, been that kind of guy. No, he never has. He's always been someone that's been very, um, if anything, cordial. But he's he's just a film fan. That's what I. I he just loves film so much. I think that's yeah. just what it comes down to. And, and he's also someone. Everything. Right. He's also an individual that has gone through ups and downs. We'll be discussing that we'll be discussing that portion about Raging Bull because mm-hmm. that was a big big movie for him uh, and his comeback ultimately. But um, he's also one of those people who we've we've just said so many great things about what a giant he was in this industry. And this should also show to you what what fucking nonsense those Academy Awards are. Am I correct to understand that he never won personally an Oscar until The Departed in 2007? I don't know if it was an Oscar or a Best Director Oscar specifically. Even, Even if it's Best Director, that's a long time after that. Really? After making so many fantastic films, yeah. Well, I know for sure it, he never had a Best Director. Right, that was the win. first one he's ever won Best Director mm-hmm. at the Oscars. I don't know if there was... I feel like he had to have gotten... At least his films, I feel, had to have gotten some sort of Oscars in the past. Um, but I don't think he specifically has ever won Best Director before The Departed. Right. And everyone was like... it. it 
it's time. <laughs> like, Which is usually how these things go, right? That, yeah. That's, that's kind of what happened. Um, that's why I also think uh, rewards for film are kind of silly. They always like, have been. Yeah. I mean, we, we talk about it at nauseum whenever we have, we're about to enter another uh, award season, right? And while we ourselves are fans of films and we would hope that, you know, the people who are in these positions of power would, you know, award these things based on merit, we have acknowledged that it never has been that way. It, it's not the way it is now. I mean, it, that's not the way that it is right now. And really, when we look at history, Marty Scorsese is an example of just how crazy the the way things work sometimes the fact that he's never won a best directing oscar when roger ebert who by many is considered to be one of the best critics of all time consistently said that scorsese made the best film of every decade i think many people would agree that he made the best film of every decade for his entire career and yet it's it's out it's not outstanding it's be eek i don't know what you say but uh i think that should sh- tell you everything you need to know about how seriously to take these academy awards which you don't take them seriously whatsoever um and so we have these amazing films in this decade in 1973 to 1983 right and it's interesting because you have the a kind of rise and a little bit of a fall and um i don't know which one of these you want to start getting at first, Peter? Not that we'll do all of them in order, but I do want to just hit main, maybe hit Main Streets first. Yeah, just because it's because, like the first major one, right? Not the not his first film, but the yeah. first one that kind of set the path for what would come afterward. Mm-hmm. Because this is the film, like I I think I saw it had like like crazy um, good reviews. Like, it's one of those where it's, like, four out of four, like, nine, like, 100% of Rotten Tomato, or, like, something really, really high. It's loved. It's beloved. Mm-hmm. Like, movie. it's beloved, beloved, beloved. And it and it feels like, like, what, but it's, I feel like it's the one of the rougher films of his, rough around the edges, especially the first half. Like, it's, it's a really good film. It's a really good film. Um uh well we should talk about what it is i you know what i feel like we don't do and we should probably do is just give like a quick rundown of what the film is that's why i have you peter go ahead okay (laughs) (laughs) hold on talk about a little bit i'll pull up uh Uh uh-huh mean streets uh came out in 1973 and it stars harvey Keitel. Um, one thing you'll notice about Scorsese as we go through these shows is that he favors um, a lot of actors. So Harvey Keitel was in in Mean Streets. I think believe he was in, in an earlier film of his and then also in Taxi Driver. Then De Niro was his main guy for like just about the rest of the 70s, 80s and 90s. And then Leonardo DiCaprio with Gangs of New York, Departed, Aviator, Shutter Island, Wolf of Wall Street. Um, his early years are nothing but Harvey Keitel and Robert yeah. De Niro. Yeah, yeah he did and, and not I, yeah. want he did not want to meet a third person <laughs> for the right for the, that first couple decades. And Robert De Niro makes his I think first noticeable role with Mean Streets. Yeah, that's like that was when he was like now he's on the up and up. Mm-hmm. And then, but Harvey Keitel was the he also starred in an earlier film. Right. For, for, and so it, it, I'm taking this very small uh, s- uh, synopsis of synopsis from Litterbox XD. Mm-hmm. That's where I usually go to. Um, and the main character is Harvey Keitel. And it says, small town hood must choose from among love, friendship, and the chance to rise within the mob. Mm-hmm. So it's very much... Uh, this young character, Harvey Keitel, you know, he he has this sort of loyalty and need to help his uh, really his shitty friend. friend. Right. <laughs> uh, and Robert De Niro, he has a, he's in love with the girl that he probably shouldn't be because of her connections to a certain mob person. And it's a lot of it's sort of like the day to day of his life struggling between being a hoodlum his sort of real catholic religion and dealing dealing with all that and 
I would say, like, especially in the beginning of the film, you see where a lot of his future work comes from. There's a lot of, like, really slow shots through a bar. There's a lot of uh, scenes happen within bars. <laughs> yes. A, a lot yes. of gangster talk, a lot of um, n- well-known songs used within scenes. Um and it's great. It's really well done. It's a little muddy though. It, it's th- throughout the first half. It felt a little repetitious, which I kind Meandering of meandering and maybe in places. Yeah. To be fair about it, you know. And I mm-hmm. think um, if I can get in, uh, you may comes- not. Oh, okay. Continue. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's interesting about, and you'll notice this throughout all of the films. What makes Marty's movies so great is, and I suspect this they all come from who he is as an individual. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these stories are all, well, all of them are are what he considers, you know, personal to him. And oftentimes as Peter and I discuss, a director really gets working with a story that they themselves are close to. That's when real movie magic happens. And I think you see a lot of, as you say, a lot of the films that follow kind of are pinpointed back to here. And a lot of the, the camera angles, the color hues, um, really kind of come from this movie. And also, at some some people might say, well, Marty makes the exact same movie all the time with all these gangster films. Maybe that can be legitimate, but he he really does in so many of these. They're all distinct from each other. Mm-hmm. When, you, when it comes to talking about the mob, which kind of mob, and with Mean Streets, it's not so much about like the inner workings, but on the very base street level of the mob and how that works, which I think is a perfect pimp, uh, a perfect way to start Begin- off. Yeah, starting off point. Whereas right. his, his later films, you get into bigger mob-like characters. Oh, yeah. Like, this is like... Um, like your typical mob goon and yeah. and what his day-to-day life would be. It's like, <laughs> and I'm using this uh, refer- uh, reference v- very deliberately. <laughs> it's like a, if you made a superhero film, <laughs> follow. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> Like following, like I don't know, like a, a, a typical the day to day life of a typical like Hydra um, agent. Stu- a- agent, yeah. Like that's basically what it would be like um, for all you nerds out there, right? <laughs> um, and it's 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 slow. It's the one I I felt like I had the hardest time just sort of sticking with Mm -hmm. like it's good it's definitely good it's entertaining clearly yeah they're just places where it kind of uh i'll admit i lost a little bit of interest halfway through Mm -hmm. and i had to take a break from it yeah uh, unlike the others and i think that may have to go with what you say is that obviously this is early scorsese hadn't refined his technique just yet and there are places in the movie where it slows down deliberately where you you really begin to wonder okay where is this going and why isn't it getting there to this point yet what what are we still doing there i mean you could argue that perhaps it's his way of making you linger within the environment and within the atmosphere of this and he does that very well but it's just like to to insert where I, where i come from is that i had the unfortunate um I should have probably began my deep dive into the Scorsese films with this one. Cause like, I'll tell you, like I saw all the big ones before this one. I saw Casino and Goodfellas and, and, and Taxi Driver and Raging Bull. And it's like, damn, you really, I set myself up to not really love this one as much as the others. It, it's hard to go from those where it's like Scorsese has taken all of his tools and just refined the hell out of them. Yeah, and then go back, it really. <laughs> perfected them, and then go back to this, and it's like it's good, but it's definitely a young, mess, younger, messier filmmaker, right? Um, but even more so than Scorsese, it's like when you look at this movie, because I know that when I had my film class, uh, this movie was pointed to as one of like the, the signature films of the 70s and what changed in that era of what you could do with how you can make them look like and what you can say with them right and in a lot of ways when i was watching mean streets not not only did i see where all of you know scorsese would do following was from here 
But really, a lot of what modern day cinema is today does come from here. I was thinking of the uh, the one of the one of the many bar scenes where they're beating the crap out of each other uh, with uh, with songs and music playing over it, and it's like, oh, this is where all of that came from. Because whether it be Kingsman or some other like uh, action movie that you see now, or Baby Driver, right? Um, the idea, or I guess you could say, where this kind of style of filmmaking came from this movie main streets Main and there's there's so many little things just like the shots of them driving around the city like one of the things i loved about i think this one because you do get a little bit of it in taxi driver but more so than this one you could tell a lot of it. it's just like guerrilla filmmaking where it's like looking at the film it feels like you could just pop into the screen and th- you're living in the 1970s. There's so many shots where it's like, these are not actors. They d- they just took a camera and they're just walking down a pretty sketchy tr- street in New York, 1972, or whenever this is taking, whenever they filmed it. Um, and that's... Uh, that's really great. That's something I really loved about it. But then there's other techniques where it's like, I don't remember seeing much of it. Like, like you said, like s- s- these slow motion shots, these, the way the, the camera angles would move, the way they would uh, uh, take a camera and, and push across uh, uh, a bar, you know, to s- into the characters and move around while they're smoking uh, while uh, a hit song is playing like so much of this sort of I don't remember seeing this kind of filmmaking before uh, Martin um, and it's it's great it's genuinely great and, and it's been so successful to the degree that now here in 2019 we're inundated with that kind of... I mean, we've seen dozens of them in all these movies. Like, it all comes from this one, and I think that's pretty special. Uh, like, uh, one that's... Just, a director that's famous for pulling from others, Quentin Tarantino. So much. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I think owes a lot to, to, right. to Martin Scorsese. But really, when you see with Mean Streets, it, it kind of... Like, Marty did with, with Mean Streets, with, what Orson Welles did with Citizen Kane. Because Citizen Kane changed the game entirely. Because mm-hmm. Citizen Kane, I think, completely revolutionized how you could move a camera in a movie. And and other aspects, certainly in terms of the visual effects that he utilized in that film back in 1942 um, and this one in 73, uh, the influences. It's amazing how long of a lifespan uh, you can trace it back to uh, and it's pretty re- remarkable, I'd say. I will say with Mean Streets is the film, while it was messy, it was good, but messy throughout the film just came together for me. Yeah, uh, it rallied at, at the at end. The I'd end. Say. Yeah, at the end, like that end, it's <laughs> it it hits you like a goddamn hurricane. Uh huh. Um, and, and and you know, uh, and leaves you with that feeling. Yes. <laughs> um, I I want to explain just a little bit because it, it, it's it's. <laughs> Har, uh, what's his name? The the whole the whole movie. Harvey Keitel. Harvey Keitel has been trying to get his friend Robert De Niro to pay back on his debts, and and Ro- Robert De Niro basically tells this other sort of mobster to go fuck himself about the debt that he holds owes yeah, him. Yeah, just stop you right there. So the the whole movie basically is try, Harvey Keitel trying to keep Robert De Niro from sealing his own grave. Basically, mm-hmm. that's the whole thing. And at every turn, De Niro is like. No, I, I I want that grave. It, it seemed like his he he did no favors to himself, right? Hell no, no. Um. So at the end, he's like, and and he feels like almost this religious burden to do something right, and that that something right is helping this friend that can't help but do everything wrong. Um. So by the end of the film, he 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 gets his friend in a car. He gets his girlfriend, who's fine. He's finally admitted that yeah, he loves her in a car, which is the cousin to uh, Robert De Niro and they're trying to skip town you know get him somewhere safe and as they're driving out <laughs> the 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 gangster who Robert De Niro owed money to comes alongside shoots the fuck out of the car uh pretty sure killed Robert De Niro because he got him right in the throat uh with one of his shots and it's visceral and violent and and the car crashes and it it ends with basically all Harvey Keitel being loaded into uh, uh, an ambulance, it? an ambulance 
along with seemingly the girlfriend and you don't really know specifically Robert De Niro. I think he's probably put on a stretcher. So the last shot you see with De Niro is as uh, I believe either the police officers or as the ambulance are arriving, you see him being engulfed by the shadow. Kind of yeah. maybe symbolizing he's he's dying. Yeah. And it it sort of ends there in, in this dark look of like this life and, and these choices and <laughs> the the music playing and then the shots of the city sort of like looking on uh uncaringly yeah. like just kind of looking from the window like oh you know another one you know it's just another day and it's like god like the film it's, it kind of feels like he went from like messy but great f- graduate of film student <laughs> looking to like become a director to by the end of the film it's like fuck it, it's Martin Scorsese it's like an origin story like, it really much fuck, is because it's Martin Scorsese like, right again you could say that the overall the quality of the film was good to begin with there were some pacing issues and um, some questionable choices in terms of uh, well in terms of where you thought the movie was going but then it just explodes at the end that's just yeah. kind of how it is and, and it brings I, yeah. together everything it was building up yeah uh for beforehand and it ties it together real nicely yeah uh, yeah so, and, uh, and part of what you'll see reoccurring is uh with, with a lot a lot of what makes uh marty's movies work are these very complicated characters um and yeah they're gangsters many of them are gangsters what he always and what I found with his movies is that and I feel some people um, misinterpret uh, the intended con- the intended effect of, of his films. Like some people have accused him of glorifying mafia violence or the mafia life in general. And it's like uh, some people, you know, have, you know, examining his films would say, no, he's, he's not glorifying them. He's making fun of them in a way. Um, and, and, and part of that with the way I you think s- he, he finds the lifestyle fascinating, but I don't think he's ever, he's ever felt the need to lie, glorify it. Um, the reality is there's just some glorifying moments to the, to the life. You get a lot of money, you get a lot of like respect, mm-hmm. you, you get a, you know, uh, women partners you know how have you look like there are there's a reason why people became gangsters yes um and and it's like and you so as an you audience have, member has to be have to be convinced why these people would go and do these yes things. um and and why they would live this lifestyle but then there's also the ugly side and man are there ugly sides yeah. to that lifestyle and i don't think he's ever came in trying to judge anyone or that lifestyle he's just like wow this is fascinating and i want to portray it in all of its uh ugliness and and glory and everything in between um and i think that's what you should do as a filmmaker um for the most part is is explore complicated characters and that's something you look at all of marty's filmography he loves exploring complicated characters (laughs) I think the next one we should talk about just because I kind of I don't care that much for it Mm -hmm. (laughs) is um, New York, New York. (laughs) And I'm kind of interested how you feel about that one. Um, Yeah. Um, I noticed that one did not have good reviews. No, it was trashed. I think it was it was legitimately trashed. I mean, the biggest offender was Roger Ebert saying um, something along the lines of, well, I mean, it was entertaining. That's, I think, from what I was reading between the lines. No, and I think this is a perfect way, uh, because as, as Main Street's kind of uh, embodied his up-and-coming rise and stature in Hollywood, this did come out in the late 70s. It came out the same year as Star Wars, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, we all know the story that uh, Marsha Lucas was editing Star Wars at the exact same time she was editing uh, or cutting this movie, New York, New York, which is a wonderful... I bet she was surprised which one would <laughs> people would consider the better film. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, but the Marsha Lucas deserves a world of uh, oh, appreciation. She's amazing yes. for cutting uh, Star Wars. I you mean, know what? And I'll say this: I feel like a lot of people have kind of like on the low 
been like, you know who was the real genius of Star Wars? <laughs> yeah. It was Marshall Lucas. Mm -hmm. Like, there's been some comments about that. Yeah. And I'm, <laughs> I think that's interesting. I think I'm not arguing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, New York, New York is easily amongst this bunch. And I would even dare say among the entire uh, list of films we'll be, we'll be covering for this uh, three part series, the least critically acclaimed the least successful and probably uh, the, the the least favorite. It's I, I would say, and this is oh god, Mean Street is a better film. Um, I would just edge out New York, New York, with with that one because I mean they're musical numbers. I don't know what I can tell. <laughs> I can Liza say. Minnelli. <laughs> so yeah, so New York, New York, uh, marked. A noticeable downward, uh, or actually a noticeable failure for Marty Scorsese. Uh, the critics didn't like it. Audiences didn't care for it. And it was ravaged in every which way from the characters to the length of the film. And it was a unique space for Scorsese. And he talks about how he was depressed after this movie. And in a lot of ways, I do feel for him because, and you can tell when you watch this movie and when he talks about it, he confirms this. He was very much going out of his way to try and doing something different with this movie oh, yeah. than he was before. And I really feel for directors that go out on a limb and they fail spectacularly. I remember how Spielberg would talk about 1941, 1942, the, the, the comedy film that he made that was... Oh, and I've, I've still never seen that. <laughs> I don't think I want to see it, but I mean, I think he would even say, it's like, wow, I really did that. But I mean, they, they really, but they took risks, you know? Mm. And this oh. was a risk. Real quick, uh, just the synopsis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the war was over and the world was falling in love again. <laughs> you know what? I, I do. It's I like that yeah. line. I don't yeah. know. It's cheesy. It's, it's the whimsical. The, uh, the end of World War II, to be clear. It's 1945. Yes. An egotistical saxophone player and a young singer met meet on VJ Day and embark upon a strained and rocky romance, even as their careers begin a long up, uphill climb. Uh, so uh, with this film, it's La La Land. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I would even throw maybe a little bit of A Star Is Born in there somewhere, but that's kind of what I. There are there, there are flavors of it thrown in here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although I although I'd say clearly a a less successful um, extent than those films were. I think yeah, those films, I, I would say as well. Those yeah. films I think succeeded in ways that I don't think this movie came close to. And I think the main part of that is that while Robert De Niro and Liza Minnelli give out terrific performances, um, I would argue because of, of the nature of those characters, their, shall I say, romantic entanglements are not as accessible to be... Um, to be left with such warm feelings as let's say the, the La La Land couple or the star is born one, you know? Yeah. It, it's, it's not as like, um, it's a rocky relationship from the start and they're both yeah. big personalities. Um, and I mean, to be clear, I mean, Robert De Niro, I don't think ever comes across as likable in this movie, which I think is the, the intent obviously here. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a lot of films about, uh, heartbreak. Like there's a, there's a film this year that I really want to see um, called uh, A Marriage Story. Um, I've heard about that, yeah. Yeah. Luckily, it comes out on Netflix, so I actually have an opportunity to watch it. Um, but there's a lot of other films, and you include La La Land, um, where you at least like that these two people are together. You understand and, and sort of the falling apart, it's, it's sad and, and you feel for it. Um, but, you know, of course, it, it, its intent is that it makes the parts when they were together so much special and da 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 da, da. you know, all, all that, all that mushy jazz. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of jazz in this movie. Oh, so yeah. that gets me all, all, just about yeah. immediately. But you don't feel it as much with these characters. It's kind of yeah. like, well, you, yeah, you probably shouldn't be together. <laughs> you know, so you don't, it, the love doesn't hit you. The love sort of doesn't hit you as hard. Um, the music is great and it's shot beautifully. That's where I come in and it's like, this is a beautifully made film. I think that that, that aspect of the movie is unquestionably great. Um, and 
in a way, I think when I say this movie and when I saw the film, you you get obviously the impression Marty was going for something that was not something he did before. Um, you get a little bit of a feeling that halfway through the movie, maybe he 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 doesn't know exactly what to do with where where it's going. You know? Yeah, it's a and, little... and especially how it ends too. Um, mm-hmm. People have really criticized that ending. Um, initially, I was like, okay, well, I guess that's just the end of that, and then that's where it is. Although there are people that would say that there was a a confusion or a misunderstanding based on how they were placed, uh, the the because they were going to meet at the end, and yeah. then what happens is both of them are um they uh, they believe that the other had basically abandoned the opportunity to, to see this through again. Well, from what I've read, I think it was Liza Minnelli just kind of going like, no. I'm not going to go see him. And then him just kind of like realizing, oh, she's moved on. Because people were saying that, no, she was going to go see him. But then she goes to the location where he said she doesn't see him there. And so she just thinks that he didn't show up. Oh. Oh, okay. Some people say. It might be, yeah, it might be a little confusing the way they, they, they did it then. I think it's because of how it was shot. It might have been a little bit confusing how it ended off that way. Yeah. But bottom line is, you know that these two are never going to work. Yeah. That's just, mm-hmm. and you get that inherent, um, you get that from the very beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. I will say, um, the musical uh, numbers are pretty fantastic. Oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> best rendition of New York, New York. That is certainly a an opinion, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, but no, but she destroys that song in the best oh, way yeah. possible. She was she's mm-hmm. great, um, as well as um, whatever uh, the other song she sings, the world or whatever it is, great. I mean, Manelli is amazing in this. Surprised mm-hmm. she didn't get more love for that role. You know, maybe it was yeah. that big of a bomb, but she was outstanding in this film. And I will say, part of me. I will give this movie credit because New York, New York is one of my favorite songs of all time. Uh, it, it it went, of course, on to be covered <laughs> or, um, or in, adopted by Frank Sinatra. And that's kind of the version that most people uh, know that song from. But it it's not a bad movie. No. See, that's uh, there's so many films that, like I said before, that in the past have been considered bad. And it's like, fuck, I would kill for this level of bad <laughs> like today. There's <laughs> greatness in this movie. There's yeah. absolute greatness in this movie. But I just feel kind of like what I said about Hook. It has so much to do with the out of this world, high expectations that directors like Scorsese and Spielberg have set for themselves. And so when a film comes along that can't, that doesn't meet the standards of the previous film, I feel in for whatever way, that's just like ripe opportunities to trash on these people. Because I think, I don't know. I just feel some people just love to write trashy reviews, but on the other side of it, these movies aren't anywhere near the level of which they were derided, you know? I feel yeah. like, it, let's say, if, if New York, New York came out this year, at the very least, Manali would be, like, in contention for Best Actress. Mm-hmm. That's how it would be. I, I, I would be like, that was a good film. That was really... Like, if it came out this year, I'd be like, yeah, that was great. Like, so... The yeah. biggest issue is just if you get into the characters and it may be, I feel... It's a little long uh, for what the story is. It could have been cut down. Okay. Um, next one, Raging Bull. And let me just do a quick synopsis. Uh, when Jake LaMotta steps into a boxing ring and obliterates his opponent, he's a prize fighter. But when he treats his family and friends the same way, he's a ticking time bomb, ready to go off at any moment. Though LaMotta wants his family's love, something always seems to come between them. Perhaps it's his violent bouts of paranoia and jealousy. This kind of rage helped him make a, make him a champ, but in real life, he winds up in the ring alone. That's a bit wordy for that one, but... <laughs> <laughs> this movie, to start off with, has been talked about as the single best sports movie ever made. That Okay, first of all, that's bullshit, okay? 
Whoever says that has never seen Space Jam. All right? <laughs> never. <laughs> Come on and jam <laughs> to the slam. I'll let that comment speak for itself. Okay, so this movie has been referred to as the single best or one of the best sports movies ever made um, in, in many regards because, while technically speaking it is, it really isn't. Um, it, it, it's a film. It's a real film that is obviously filled with character and drama. But I will say that when it comes to boxing, and I will say this, when the movie opened, I was like, oh, fuck, I have to watch a movie about boxing because um, I don't care for boxing and I also don't care for any kind of sport. And that's kind of the inherent flaw of sports movies for me. I can get interested to a point, but when you start getting into that nonsense, I completely tune out. That didn't happen here. And it didn't happen here for a very good reason. You have Marty, but it it's how he directed those scenes that made them interesting he made watching sports beautiful and interesting which is something that i couldn't possibly fathom but it it's more than just how he shot it but it's also how they were presented there is uh, i think the, the motif that he uses is this operatic kind of music that accompanies when they're in the ring and when one is taking a beating and you and you feel as if you're actually there getting those punches or, or hitting them, you know? And it's so transformative. Mm -hmm. I, I would also say the film doesn't, isn't a like quote unquote sports film. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a character study exactly. about a guy who happened to be a boxer. Mm -hmm. Like, like the boxing is kind of secondary to everything. Right. Um, and uh, so many sports films, it's like a, a, a quote unquote sports film. So everything is, a, it's about the sport. It's about them becoming a good uh, like if it's a regular boxing movie, it's about this young up and, up and coming boxer learning to box and and going through all the training and, and you you look at his like biggest Rocky? fights. Um, no, well, a little bit, yeah. Um, or uh, yeah. there's Remember the Titans. Yeah, a lot of it is is it's about the sport and about them playing it, and then everything else is kind of secondary. Whereas with this. It's about the character. Yeah. It's about the story of their life. And then, but it, they just happen to be a boxer. This is the film that he made after the disaster of New York, New York. And this is an example, I think you could say, of when a director is kind of pushed um, to not, I think it's the opposite of resting on your laurels, but kind of pushed up against the wall and he has to come up with something. And I mean, Let's just say what it is. This movie is a damn masterpiece uh, from top to bottom when it comes to the obviously the uh, the noir aspect of it with the black and white, the score and the performances. And I believe this is one of the times De Niro won for best actor for Ray LaMotta and deservedly so. De Niro destroys this performance and Pesci is quite good in this as well. And it's refreshing to see Pesci be a good guy for a change. I'll just say that. <laughs> Whoa, I don't know if we would go that far. <laughs> well, oh wait. It's refreshing to see Pesci be a good guy. He's not a murderer. <laughs> in the confines of what the 1940s would consider to be good. How's that? Uh, <laughs> because he's not a murderer. Let's just leave it I'll, at that. Yeah, let's just leave it at that he's not a murderer. <laughs> yeah, because there is a um, lot of um, abuse. Believe it oh there. god yeah. it could be called abuse the movie um but <laughs> i will say i think that was joe pesci's first film yeah one of the first ones um because i could have swore i don't know if it said like introducing joe pesci at the beginning but like it was like that was his big break uh raging bull um and it must have been i didn't realize how bad it was because i was reading on wikipedia i saw i don't know if this is wrong or not i saw something say like it was supposed to be his last film or like oh. i like uh martin scorsese so like i don't know if there's more to that or what was going on if he was that disillusioned after a new york new york no he was but, uh -huh. it was terrible it was 
pretty bad. I think he got really low. Um, but then he made this movie and it kind of, in a lot of ways, if you look at what the narrative of the, the narrative is of this film, it's about this guy who has a dream and it's very much in reach, but in many ways he can't ever get there because of who he is and his uh, self-sabotage destructive, his self-destructive ways. And I guess you could kind of infer that Scorsese was kind of feeling that in a way, because up until that point, he was being talked about as this next big thing in the scene of cinema. And then to have such a colossal disaster with New York, New York, I think you can infer that he was very much in a, in a, in a space where he can very much identify with La Mata, the, the, yeah. the character you're talking about in this movie. It was a great film. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like uh, specifics. Um, well, we talked with De Niro. Oh yeah, De Niro's great. Um, one of his best. I don't even know if I can say that. I feel like every film is one of his best performances, <laughs> at least in this time period. I think this is one of the ones where it's like it's so good, you could talk about being up there in the best in the discussion mm-hmm. of the very best of De Niro. Mm-hmm. Um. I do think I I do have what I would consider his best performance, but we'll get to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, in the next couple ones. Um, but I thought he was fantastic. You see the instant chemistry between him and um, Pesci. Yeah. Um, they are fantastic together. Um, I agree with you that the way in which the boxing matches are shot are pretty beautiful. And, and it, and it reminds you what a great director is where he didn't just go in like, all right, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to just, they're going to punch each other and we're going to film it. You know, it's like everything was so deliberate um, when it came to the, the boxing matches. And then a big thing with, uh, actors now is oh how they transform did you see how they transformed for this uh for this role and you can say uh, throw that out there for robert de niro because he he packed on i think it was like 60 pounds oh yeah of fat Mm -hmm. to play him in his older years and then of course in his younger years you know ripped as heck so i mean you don't see chris hemsworth doing that for uh i guess what fat (laughs) thor or bro thor whatever you want to call him well, they I'm pretty sure they never gave him time to get big. Yeah. But but no. Yeah. Re- Regine Bull is fantastic. It's a transformative it's a- performance is mm-hmm. what it is and it's like a lot of I guess what you could call method acting um could come from here in a sense. And another trope that this would seemingly expose is of course this is uh De Niro portraying a real life figure that of course ends up winning the Academy Award. So with good reason, will, obviously, it was an outstanding performance. Um, I will say everyone sort of considers this his um, magnum opus. Uh, I would not. I understand why it would be mm-hmm. that way. Why uh, people feel that way. Yeah. yeah. Especially considering where he was as a director mm-hmm. in this time. But it's not my favorite. Um, yeah. That's just kind of where it agree. is. I appreciate the film. I respect it tremendously. And I like it. But it's like... Maybe it's just me, but this is like, I feel maybe the least rewatchable of his movies or among the least rewatchable of his movies. I'm not sure. Um, it's heavy in a way that's not always entertaining. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what it is, uh-huh. but it's outstanding uh, and it definitely yeah. deserved all the praise. And I understand why people come at it and like, it's his magnum opus, but I feel the next one we're going to talk about is like the magnum opus. And it's interesting, right? comedy. King of <laughs> it's interesting, right? Because, you know, I feel like this would change or director's films and what they're considered to be their magnum opus could change with generation to generation, right? Um, mm-hmm. A lot of... Uh, I know that I've spoken with many people uh, who are in our age demographic who have seen Citizen Kane, their cinema files, but personally, while they enjoyed the film they don't understand why that is the film that is consistently like the best film ever made. It's no joker. (laughs) Our, yeah. Our friend Eric, um, is one of those people. And the film that he prefers as like 
the best film is Lawrence of Arabia. That's a that's a good that's a good pick. I would say. Yeah, Nettie <laughs> prefers Casablanca um, mm-hmm. to that. So it's like these things change. I think to generation. And while Raging Bull, I think would definitely be the magnum opus to the older crowd. It's Taxi Driver that I think has definitely captured the hearts of uh, I think our generation in a sense. But I do think that for me, Taxi Driver is the Scorsese film. And I would think you would agree with that as well. Uh, I think it's easily and just like, just imagine how hard it is to say easily with how many great <laughs> films Martin Scorsese has made. I think it's, it's like saying, easily. It's like saying, well, no, that's a bad comparison. Uh, I, I was <laughs> going to say like, it's like saying, it's as easy as saying, what's the best Thor film, but it's also a disservice to Scorsese because two out of three of those movies are not good or well, not yeah. good, but they're not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. My, com- my point is that they're all, f- he makes fantastic films and for it to be easily the best is says a lot. Um, this, so I think taxi driver is easily his best film. Um, I think it's Robert De Niro's best performance. Like it's it's a lot of bests like from like the script, I think, is maybe perfect. Um, the performance like Robert De Niro at his best. The directing is fantastic. Everything, every scene, every line of dialogue, every look that the character gives just feels so deliberate and important. And the music is amazing. Um, it, it's just such an atmospheric, wonderfully told character study where you could watch many times and gain so much from it. And it's just, it, it's one of those films where I love a film that's just like tight, that's tight, where every you there is no fluff at all where you can go from scene to scene to scene where like that line is important that shot is important um that musical cue is important it's it's one of those films um oh before i let you uh go in and tell me why i'm wrong um let me pull up (laughs) the uh synopsis so to speak okay on every street in every city, there's a nobody who dreams of being a somebody. A mentally unstable Vietnam War veteran works as a nighttime taxi driver in New York City where the perceived decadence and sleaze feeds his urge for violent action, attempting to save a pre-adolescent prostitute in the process. Played by Jodie Foster. That was, that was something. I was like, oh shit, that's Jodie Foster. Uh, when I saw her come up, um, yeah. You know, far be it for me to pretend to say anything that hasn't already been said about this movie, you know, and that's kind of maybe a flaw in this, but it's also a great privilege to be able to discuss about it because I agree with every word of what you said uh, about Taxi Driver. This is, I think, as good as you can make a movie. And I remember, I'll remember anyway in terms of how my first viewing experience of this film was, is being one of those rare films. And I mean the films that you just know absolutely nothing about, not films like when we go see nowadays and we have like this good idea of what it's going to be about or this like hyper anticipation, but just films that you don't know what it's going to be about or what's going to happen. But what I will remember about this movie is how it started And more importantly, what it did when the movie began and that it just grabbed me instantly. It's and it does what it, I think, sets out to do. And it's like it hooks you with this hypnotic appeal in this way. The whole film is described to be this um, from what Marty says, films are supposed to be they capture you by being very dreamlike. Uh, they, they kind of hook you on in that sense. And that's, I think, how this movie just gets you because you're just soaked in this imagery that is like a dream. And it's mesmerizing. It is. That's, I'm sorry, I forget, that's the best word. It's mesmerizing. And you, you can't look away, you know? It's like you're just like immediately sucked into this. And even if you wanted to, 
you couldn't stop watching. And I can't think of many films that have done it to that extent. I mean, this this may be in a league all in of itself where it's done that to that level. That's a real masterwork of, of cinema if I ever seen anything where it just gets you. And <laughs> you don't have a choice if whether or not you care what's happening. You're going to sit there and you're going to watch the whole damn thing. And that's when he's at his very best. And it also helps in those opening moments with that. And I really cannot overstate this masterpiece of a score. If there ever was, and I I'll, I put this up there with Star Wars, if there ever was a movie that benefited a lot from its score and it was so ingrained with it, it's this one. And of course, I mean, I, I do love jazz, so there's that. I'm, I mean, it could immediately get me with that, but it got me. And, oh God, I think there was like a whole week after I saw the film where I was just soaking myself in that score. Um, it's instantly one of the best scores of all time for any film. And it definitely sold that mesmerizing environment that it was meant to do. And I think on that level in and of itself, it's kind of unparalleled and you don't see that really with it. And then of course, the second layer with uh, Travis Bickle, the main character here portrayed by Robert De Niro in what could be Again, the poster child or, or the, the poster for or the face of character studies in general. And it's interesting, right? Because immediately you, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of frightened by him almost immediately in a way that he, he, he has some proclivities that are, that verge on, I mean, clearly on insanity, but on some, when he says, uh, I hope a, a real rain comes and washes the scum off the streets, there's a intense level of hatred in there and self-loathing for sure. Yeah, like that beginning where he's talking about like the filth and all this, all I could think of is a... Uh... I, I don't think you've read... Well, I, I'm not 100% sure you haven't read the graphic novel. I don't know if you've seen the film. Uh, Watchmen. Um, all I could think of it was Rorschach, which is supposed to be like this... high, Basically a critique of Batman, where he's basically a crazy vigilante. And uh, a lot of the the story is told through his voiceover so, and, and, and his journal. So it'll be like Rorschach's journal, uh, 1980. 83 uh the prostitutes and the filth came out tonight you know it, it, like it, it's a lot of that and that's what it reminded me, me a lot of like right at the beginning uh but yeah go ahead no <laughs> and it. yeah th that point is definitely well made but this is a character study at its I, I guess base level and what makes it a great character study is the complexity to this character. We've spoken about how in just about every Scorsese film, there are layers of complexity to his characters, which make his movies fantastic. And this one is probably the example of uh, how deeply complex a character is, because especially with this one, I, for a lot of this movie was just like, and I mean, I, I don't know, I may be a uh, exception to the rule when it comes to this, or maybe it was the point all along. Obviously, the nature of this character, the unpredictability, the damn near insanity and a little bit of the hypocrisy, uh, as uh, Betsy calls him a walking contradiction, which is very much what he is, keeps you at a very big distance and you're never quite sure what to feel about this guy. There are aspects of it, of him that are likable and there are aspects of him that are downright disturbing. Um, and considering what he does, it's interesting. And we'll get to that ending because that's a very much big debated ending. But <sighs> there's something heroic about him, but there's also something... I don't, I don't want to say demonic, but just da damn near frightening about him. Um, yeah, there's a lot to say about Travis Bickle. I want to let you steer the wheel on that and where you want to go. Um, 
What's great about this film is it's very much of the time. And, and, and you can see that within its character and sort of the feelings of that time period. So uh, what, what was this film, like 1970? 1976. Oh, perfect. Okay. So at this time, you know, c- crime is on the up and up in a big, bad way. You know, it's from now until the 80s. Um, it's not, I think, until the 90s or late 80s where they start to get that under control. Um, again, post-Vietnam, uh, there's just... A, America was in a very nihilistic position. Um, and so you have this young... Uh, war veteran and immediately you're pulled in and you sort of understand his loneliness and his his sort of violent tendencies and where they come from and like I, I, I agree he is a walking contradiction he talks about the filth and how these people are bad but all he can think about is doing violent things and and acting out in violent ways and also other examples to to back that up is he talks about all the filth that lives at night at new york city he goes to pornos yes and he doesn't even think twice about that he just goes mm-hmm. and he he even takes betsy to that and it's like dude what are you doing <laughs> Yeah, that's just, yeah, and he doesn't even sort of realize why it is that would be socially unacceptable. Um, so he's someone with severe mental problems who, by the end of the film, arguably does a good thing, but, and, and you know, he says his reasoning for it on the surface might sound good, he wants to help this girl, but the the reality of the situation is he's probably just looking for a reason to kill and 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 to be somebody to do anything um God, it's so well done. This is a good time to mention <laughs> uh the interview that Eber did with Scorsese and Scorsese talking about this movie in terms of that aspect you just referenced about uh Travis Bickle in that he has what you would call the the uh madonna whore complex in a sense where you have uh because i think paul schrader uh who wrote the screenplay of this movie also did another one of a a similar film whose name is escaping me right now but the comparisons between those lead characters in which they are compelled to be the savior in 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 the the create these situations for themselves where they are compelled to be the savior in which they are saving these young women from what they perceive to be a toxic and bad environment, regardless of whether or not the people that they are saving are in actual danger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they, but they need like he, like you get this sort of feeling like the way Travis Pickle talks about the filth and the, all the disgusting people and all that. You, you get this feeling if they were to disappear, then, you know, tomorrow he wouldn't, his need for violence wouldn't disappear. His disgust wouldn't disappear with them. Um, it's, it's sort of just a place to put those feelings. I think what's inherent in this and... I mean, I'm not sure if 70s audiences would be as quote unquote woke about this, but it's like, I think the inherent disgust that he feels toward people is in itself disgusting, at least to me, uh, because you see in several different examples, it's it's not as if he's just talking about crime or like, uh, you know, bad people, but like there are several instances where he is giving these hate-filled longing looks at african americans mm-hmm. and gay people absolutely that that's something that's why and i know this <laughs> this probably because you don't know much about the character but that's why it reminded me so much of rorschach because he's someone that conflates he conflated you know crime and these other things that we would consider actually bad with simply being different and and he would put you know, a murderer and uh politician prostitute uh gays like all of them would be in this giant tub labeled bad um it, it it's 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 interesting 
um it, it's the othering of people <laughs> that uh, you can see why someone would fall down like in today's modern day and age an alt-right hole so to speak a young and angry individual <laughs> like if they remade it half of this film would just be a uh, Travis Bickle on the internet. They kind of re- did remake it um, with, you know, what's about to hit a billion dollars. Oh, I, I haven't seen yeah, the no, film. I'll tell so. you that in a bit right now. But I will, I'll go a step farther than you and I'll say that this is exactly the blueprint for what we're seeing in the rise of um, alt-right terrorism, domestic terrorism in this country. And the insane mindset that is used um, to do this. But we should take this moment since we're on that on that very uh, point of the movie. We just had several shows and we're in the midst of this controversy about whether or not Joker was problematic or dangerous. But it's a recycled talking point of other films that are that are long in our past that have had this discussion. And one of those films was Taxi Driver. I think in the time that it was released, many people were disgusted by the insane level of violence that was at the very least at the end of the movie that was displayed and then of course it became this film in and of itself and travis bickle became a an icon of some sorts for the inevitable would-be assassin assassinator of president uh ronald reagan the the assassination attempt that happened uh, the person who did this pretty much said that he got the inspiration from the exact scene in this film where Bickle was attempting to assassinate Palant, uh, Palantine, which I have to ask George Lucas if he got the name Palpatine from Palantine. Yeah, every time I saw it pop up, I wanted to say Palpatine. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks like Palpatine. And I don't know if it's just we're yeah. big Star Wars nerds, but like this came out before Star Wars. Jedi was at least a good, I want to say, eight, nine years away. And I'm not even, but they never say Palpatine. Palpatine's in not in the films. movie, right? The, the name wasn't uttered in that movie, so he had years it wasn't and until years. The prequels, right? He yeah. had years and years to come up with the name Palpatine. It was and yeah. Palpatine was a politician. Remember in the prequels, yeah. a senator, a dirty politician, a senator to be clear, uh, a senator who had aspirations to be the quote unquote president of that body. So it's like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. We might be onto something we, with that. We may, but the is point it? is that assassination attempt in the film was an inspiration for a real live assassination attempt and i think this comes into the question of what what do we make of that do we really blame the filmmakers for that uh what, what i say no i say no as well because yeah. I, if you're making a film like i don't know what that's like pretty openly just pushing like go kill politicians Okay, like I, I, I can we can argue that the message is clear cut and probably dangerous, but I think there's a lot of films out there that are either that you're not supposed to, you're very clearly not supposed to be on the side of our titular character, and people are just really dumb and <laughs> they end up falling in love. Like with Wall Street, um, the the titular character of Wall Street was not the good guy. Him seeing, saying greed is good was not this wonderful declaration that the audience was supposed to go like, yeah, greed is Just good. Just you're talking about I, I sh- Jordan Belfort portrayed by Leo DiCaprio in The Wolf of Wall Street. No. No? Oh, Wall Street. Which, oh, never mind. Wrong. I guess I could fit too. Have you heard of Wall Street? Yes. I just thought you were talking about Wolf of Wall Street because we're talking no, about Scorsese. No, 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 no. I that's another one you can argue that like that they don't explicitly say like this is good, but with Wall Street specifically, it was kind of a condemnation of that sort of uh, thinking. Reagan era eighties, you know, all that jazz. But uh, oh, what's his name? Stone, the the director, political guy, Roger Stone. Not Roger or? Stone. Oliver, Oliver Stone. Stern. Roger Stone is uh, the, you know, the guy who's Republican. Being, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but he said so many people came up to him and said, like, oh, my God, your film made me want to become 
uh, work on Wall Street and stuff like that. And he's like, y- y- like, just imagine how difficult that is for him. Like, holy fuck, like you did not watch the movie if that's, if that's the shit you're saying. Or you clearly didn't understand it. And that's hard. Like, that's really hard. Because, like, even looking at comedy, you, you can make jokes making fun of racists, right? But then people, actual racists, will go, like, will take the joke and go, like, LOL, yeah, that's funny. And then you're like, wait, why do you think it's funny? Because they're making fun of the Mexican. No, they're making fun of the person being stupid enough to make fun of the Mexican. But, like, be... <sighs> It's it's tough, right? It, it's tough to ride that line, especially if you understand that there's a good portion of the population that is so stupid, they're going to take the complete opposite point of what you're trying to make away. And then it becomes like, you know, what can you do at that point? I, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's that's my little spiel on it's, that. You have a dilemma about film and how it's interpreted. Um, generally speaking, when it comes to violence in that area of it, I don't ever hold the creators at fault for that because it's not as if they were trying to incite violence anyway. And that's just not. I'm never somebody who should who believes that censoring art is the answer to somehow. I don't know, preventing a tragedy as if that was ever, as if that was actually going to do something. But I will say, um, I have no issue with provocative um, films and, and, and violent films. There is a line like, but can't you say like if you make an, this needs to be said because you just talked about how a large section of the population is stupid. Um, And I think a lot of people, would be offended by that and if you are oh well listen because i'm about to double down on that um <laughs> oh and i'd triple down on yeah, that <laughs> um and this is not to be mean-spirited but it's just to be real you know we're just this mm-hmm. is how we feel about it this i mean the reality is and i feel the boomers and, and the other generation would be a little bit guilty about this um uh, in terms of general population and general audiences in the fact that just because a movie has a particular message or is is telling a particular story does not mean that the creators themselves are endorsing that message. Like, for example, if Joe and Anthony Russo with Infinity War have this main character with Thanos and his main mission is to wipe out half of existence for population control, that's not Joe and Anthony Russo saying, yeah, we're in favor of killing half of the population, you know, to ensure that we survive as a society. But, like... That guy, I, uh, it feels so stupid to have to say that. Like he's the villain. If 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 that was genuinely the viewpoint of the filmmakers, why would they give it to the villain, <laughs> and make him see cut out to be this evil guy? But I know, like again, I, I'll 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 be the one to do it as I do every podcast. The Last Jedi. <laughs> everyone attacks that film oh let the past die yes the villain of the film said that that wasn't the message of the i oh god yeah go ahead i had to do it i'm sorry travis bickle for example is um i I mean if it were released today it'd be like attacked as a problematic character because a lot of white domestic terrorists could look at that and like yeah that guy has the right idea I'm going to go do exactly what he did. And, but again, you, you, because the, the film ends with this perceived notion that he is the hero. But if you're paying attention, there is this lingering suspicion in the air that he's going to do this shit again. And maybe the next time he does it, it's going to be a real horrendous event that he creates. And it's not going to be for something heroic. No. Again, in his head, he might perceive it as heroic. But it won't be. And like, this is where I think it's a good time to talk about the ending because um, I get what it seemed like. I guess a lot of people assumed that like maybe he died during that whole thing. And that he imagined the last part. The the last moments of the film are his his dream as he's dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his imagining, you know, because he's viewed as a hero. And then the girl, she she kind of deliberately the his love interest kind of stops by and tries to get a cat from him. And, you know, like, oh, she views him as heroic as well. Um, But 
from what Scorsese said and um, Paul Schrader is that like, no, like we, we did not write it with that intent. Although, again, if you pull that from the film, I think that's perfect. I think fine. Ebert pulled that from the film. Yeah. And if, if that's what you believe, that's cool. I love a different interpretations for films. Um, but I, they said that's that wasn't their intent. That if you see the last shot of the film was as he's driving away, he's, he notices something that sort of gets him angry or whatever. And, and, and their belief was that like you could loop the ending of the film back to the very beginning of the film, which is like nothing's changed um with him he he's still a ticking time bomb that's exactly um, it he's a ticking time yeah. bomb i i love the ending i think that's fantastic and again like that's if if you engage with the art of the film um uh you probably shouldn't come away with endors endorsing the film endorsing this crazy person um and that's that's what's difficult. Art is meant to be I think it's meant to push boundaries. Yes. It's meant to ask serious questions Absolutely. about who we are. Um, you, look, I have to I'm sorry if I have to harp on this, but for all those people who have issues with Star Wars being political, you people need to listen up. All art is political. Listen up. All art is inherently political. When I say inherently, it is in the DNA of art and all of the subsequent mediums. Film in and of itself, the history of film and why film even exists in the first place comes from that. The studio system was all made up of immigrants, people who came to this country and created these businesses and, and embraced the capitalist nature in america <laughs> um there were some good but things like, that came you, out of capitalism when capitalism works it's i, I think it's yes. great um when it doesn't it yeah, a lot of people can die um much like any system um so, but the the i guess my thing is it's like if you make a film what who you cast inherently is political even if you don't intend it to, every experience you've had in your life has pushed you sort of towards making that certain decision. If you cast a white person or a black person or a woman or whatever, like you, you can't escape the politics that has influenced you to make the decisions that you are now currently making. Even if you have no idea that they even exist, you know what I mean? And 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 then it's like, and then people i've seen people try to fight back at this whole art is political and say like well like oh here i drew a circle what's political about that <sighs> <laughs> and it's like welp you created art with the intent to <laughs> to uh protest the idea that art is and political protest therefore political? <laughs> making it political <laughs> here's the thing you can't escape it here's the thing and this is um I feel the misconception about film and movies in today's uh, pop culture and, in extent, society. Ooh, he's the society word. <laughs> God. I love movies, clearly, and so do you, Peter. And a big part of why you and I love movies and why many people love movies is entertainment and entertainment value. But... What I feel is the deep misunderstanding of cinema in 2019 to most people is film is not just entertainment. In fact, that's that's the last thing it often can be because film from its inception was always done and created with the purpose to challenge with the purpose to make you think. That's why some of the best films of all time, like we just discussed The Shining or 2001 or Taxi Driver, these films are regarded as the best of all time, not necessarily because they're entertaining, and they are to an extent, but because they make you think. They make you question yourself. And to me, the films that I, or what I consider to be what the best of cinema is, is, huh, is, is, they, in so many ways are commentaries on society. Yes, we live in a society. I said it, whatever. But 
And it's not just one society. I'm the Joker, baby. It's not just our <laughs> society. It's it's a commentary on human beings and why it is they do what they do. And in many ways, it can be very relevant to the times of which you are born into. And that's what I think the real power of cinema is, is that in many ways, they can be designed to force you to reevaluate yourself, your life, where this goddamn country is going. And I don't mean necessarily now, but it could be for all of time. So I think people have this general misunderstanding about what it is that it, it's not just entertainment, is it is art. And damn it, art has always been political. And if you don't understand that, then you have a deep-seated misunderstanding of what film is. It's as simple as that. Well, I, I would also argue that it's only entertaining because it's stimulating, right? Like, and, and, <laughs> because I'm, I'm thinking, I'm interpreting characters, I'm going like, wow, that's a beautiful shot. Um, that That's wonderful dialogue. I'm thinking about the characters. I'm thinking about the story. That's me being entertained. And I never understood at what point does, like, did, like being stimulated in that way and entertainment be two separate things when I think you sort of need both like even in films that are literally just like I don't know big blockbuster punch fests like uh I, you can still be stimulated by the way in which the film is shot the way it's created um the the musical score like it, it when it when it's not like heavily dialogue driven or a character study where it's mostly just like a john wick um you would say like i'm being stimulated by the action scenes and and the the beautifully the beautiful way in which they're composed um like i don't know where entertainment meant lack of effort and I feel like that's what it is for a lot of people. Like, what? I'm supposed to think? And it's like, well, yeah, like, that's what's entertaining or about another it. aspect of this that can speak to both the, pol the politics of not just people being offended by certain politics, but also the politics of how movies are made today and what Scorsese is talking about today. Not just the lack of effort, but the lack of risk and the, the tendency to play it safe. And you play it safe by not taking a risk and but when you do take a risk that inherently can be political yeah uh complacency is political doing nothing and and endorsing the status quo is political you cannot escape politics and it's like i don't know what a non-political film would be i guess it would just be like flashing colors on screen so that's like Squad? i <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well i don't know what you're talking about that's a great political film of our time um it won an oscar it won an oscar that's more than marty can say um <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i don't know why people are so intent on removing meaning from art you do. i mean well i i guess i do a certain quadrant or a certain group of them you know exactly what it is it's because in yeah. many of these films the politics are against their personal politics and they don't want films in which they seek entertainment to attack them with talking points of which they perceive to be contra to their political identity and they can't stand that that's what it is but like this whole thing of like remove politics from uh, from our entertainment i i don't want politics shoved down my throat uh and then also in the next breath the joker is the greatest film of the 21st century <laughs> like i how how do you how are you someone that's able to hold both those beliefs in like at the same time and like i've seen people say some crazy stupid shit i've seen people say that the Terminator films, the original two, weren't political. That RoboCop wasn't political. That Star Wars, like, the original Star wasn't Wars, wasn't political. Like, 
in which there is extensive, extensive footage of George Lucas being like, oh, yeah, like just there. There's documentaries like talking about the political aspects of Star Wars. The evil Wars. empire like, in Star fuck. Wars is basically the Nazis. I mean, I don't know how clear you can be. And the United States. Yeah. Like people forget that Absolutely. because he was uh, George Lucas was very much, you know, a uh, college kid in the 70s, like w- w- a college kid in the 70s, film student, in fact, you know, the people that we typically know to be the least political people. Like, what the fuck, guys? Come on. Like, he's bas- he literally said, like, the, the rebels he viewed as like... um uh shit what was it like the 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 Viet Cong that we would fight at, at the time and the United States was viewed as sort of this empire but then so it's an amalgamation of of the United States and Nazi Germany and like you know if you if you were to just tell people that they'd get like hardcore uh excuse my language triggered uh (laughs) if you just say that but it's like that's directly from george lucas's mouth and that's not even from a long time ago that's recently he did an interview with james cameron james cameron who literally okay i can't i'm gonna start ranting i'll just say this real quick to put a button on the star wars issue the fact that the political aspects of Star Wars in and of itself have seemingly been lost to time in the consciousness of American pop culture in and of itself, I think, prove your point, Peter. Let's just be real about Mm -hmm. that. Second of all, the fact that Joker is as successful as it is and as beloved by those same people that bemoaned Jedi for having politics, I think destroys their entire argument. I've been very critical of Joker as being mediocre in terms of the message that is trying to get out there and it maybe they you could speak to the inherent flaw of joker of how politically ambiguous it actually is which is i think a detriment to the success of the film why they like it but joker has so much going on that is beyond daylight political Mm -hmm. like it's talking at you about what the politics are doing and for Mm -hmm. the alt-right to hold it up as an example of what movies can be without being you know held down by politicized like to these people literally and like i've heard some of the stuff about joker talking about like class warfare and all that shit kind of lefty shit And, and, and but then what's ruining film is the fact that the main character over here is now black or is a woman or your video game side character is identifies as non-binary like this is what's destroying cinema and politics is getting out of control but the film that seems to heavily rely on a lot of political talk like joker is like oh no that's great so like that tells me it's not that you hate politics it's that you hate a certain group of people um you know (laughs) your nazism is showing like (laughs) it really is that way like it's so so much i i feel like that whole get politics out of um my entertainment is a huge dog whistle for like kind of being a right-wing fuckhead uh that's why i reject that shit immediately and it's like if if you're someone saying that okay you're kind of not someone worth having a conversation with because you're you're just dog whistling at much more scary there's a lot there's more scarier shit going by going on behind the scenes with you i don't know that's the way i feel (laughs) i agree with you 100 percent. that's what that's what's really going on it's not because this woman has purple hair or they killed off this character there. Really at the root of all of that is what you just described. And I wish more people would just just say that because I feel it's abundantly obvious that that's what's going like, on. Like, let me put it this way. If the Joker was the exact same film, like exact, with the same level of amazing performance, but they hired a woman in the lead role... I don't think I think these people would be panning like attacking the shit out of it. I'm sorry, we took a huge detour into 
nauseum. <laughs> Taxi Driver is great, y'all. Go see it. That's all I gotta yeah, say. Go, go see it while it's still in <laughs> well, theaters. It, it does <laughs> the remake anyway. It Joker is relevant in this regard in that it, in a way it 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 goes for it, it tries to do what Taxi Driver did in its lead character being uh this very ambiguous and troublesome anti-hero um and a commentary about society whatsoever and everything i i i'm I, i'm trying so hard not to say like, if you like the movie good good but i think what you have to look at and kind of where i get aggravated is Damn, this Joker movie is really about to hit a billion dollars. But it's like part of me as a fan of film, this is this is proving Martin Scorsese right. Because yeah. while, yes, you people may have loved this movie, and good for you if you did, not taking anything away from that. We all know the truth. We know the truth. <laughs> if this movie was just about some random clown and if you took away the name Joker I guarantee you 850 million of those bucks would be snapped away just like that because nobody would have gone yeah. to go watch it nobody mm -hmm. would have bothered to nobody would have cared to you see what I'm saying mm -hmm. and so that is what Marty is saying is that a film like that should if it's good enough make that amount of money but it can't and I because of superheroes I, I used to always tell people like, you know, watch what you love and all that. Um, but I but I feel more like take I, I feel like saying instead take chances every once in a while. Like because I, I think you'll be surprised at what you like. Kind of like food, right? Like I'm a real picky eater. But if every once in a while you take a chance on a, on a new type of food, you might be surprised at, at at how far your palate goes, and I think the same can be said for your um, view of cinema. Like for people that really love Joker, if you're watching this and you love Joker and you've never seen Taxi Ooh. Driver, oh my God, go watch Taxi Driver! Like you're gonna fall in love. Like it seems like anyway. Like go go do it, and like maybe a Taxi Driver was a film you heard about, but just never like gave a shit, you know. But if if you found Joker genuinely entertaining. Uh, g give it a shot. Um, ex expand your horizons. It, it, you'll be surprised by um, what you might find. And, and this would be a good segue into King of Comedy, because in my initial review of Joker is that it borrowed as much from Taxi Driver as it did um, with King of Comedy, a film I happen to really like. Um, it's oh, let yeah. me go ahead. The synopsis uh, of Camp Comedy. Okay. Synopsis: It's no laughing matter. <laughs> <laughs> I love the taglines. It's great. <laughs> Aspiring comic Rupert, Rupert Pupkin attempts to achieve success in show business by stalking his idol, a late night talk show host who craves his own privacy. Um, I like it. I do. It's not. Uh, it's not the best Scorsese. It. I think it's clearly bottom tier, but again, it's still really good. You know, bottom tier Scorsese is pretty much every other director's top tier. Let's be yeah. real here. <laughs> no, uh, King Comedy was engrossing to me. I I really enjoyed it, um, and mainly because of just how. I mean, I guess it's not, it's not considered to be as weird now as it was. I know. Roger Ebert hated this movie the first time he saw it, and then he liked it more the second time he saw it. Um, this is, by the way, a lot. If you've seen Joker, you would be surprised how the movie kind of ripped off like a lot of like, like I feel like the a lot of scenes in King of Comedy play out that that play out play out exactly the same in Joker. That's how startling startlingly similar it is. Um, so you have Robert De Niro playing, portraying Richard Pupkin. Uh, these names are terrific, by the way. Whoever came up with these names, um, Pupkin. <laughs> that is not De a De Niro. Real name. Um, this is a very different character than he's played 
um, which is good. I mean, he did, he does a variety of things. Um, different in that uh, he has seen he seems very approachable, um, but only uh, you're given hints of it initially. But only later in the film do you realize what a complete nutcase this guy is, and yet he is so ever convinced that he is just doing the right thing he never comes across as somebody who believes he is doing something despicable or evil but he's doing things from his perspective that are are yes they're selfish but he doesn't consider anything he does to be bad and to be clear the really bad stuff doesn't happen until the second half of the film but all along you're you're again like with many of these characters it's kind of like a puzzle piece trying to figure out exactly what this guy is all about and what he's doing here. Clearly you have a comedian here. He wants to make it big time on Jerry Lewis's show. Um, and he tries ever so desperately to, um, to get on the show and to be successful all the while, as we're, we're getting to know that we're being thrown off by extended sequences of a relationship um, that the movie wants to convince us is genuine with Jerry Lewis's character and uh, and Robert De Niro's character. But then later on in the film, do you realize, I think halfway through you realize, that was total BS and that these extended sequences of the film were completely in his head, were completely in his mind, and which makes for a great and wonderful twist. Something I criticize Joker not for doing, but for doing it in the Not 21st century as well. <laughs> way, because they literally had to go back to those moments just to make sure people understood. Hey, by the way, oh, those it did scene- that yeah. thing. Oh, I hate when they, films it do did that. that. It went back to those scenes just to make sure that this person was never really there the entire time. Whereas in this film, it trusts you that you understand that all that stuff that was happening didn't happen. I also think it's probably good that it comes halfway through the film too. Um, again, I don't know how it, it was with Joker, but I feel like these kind of reveals, usually when it's at the end of the film, they feel kind of, it, it depends on the story you're telling, obviously. Um, but it can come off a little bit like twist for twist's sake. Like, oh, he's crazy. He imagined it the whole time. Like, I, I like it better when films kind of drop hints throughout the film. It's like Shutter Island, for example, was the one I just saw. Yes. Which That's we'll a talk good about one. more in the next episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, ooh, I, I really like Shutter Island. We'll get into that. Um, but with this, yeah, I agree. It, it was one of those where it was really well done. And and <laughs> and at least in this one, Robert De Niro isn't going like, who are you fucking looking at? Like, he, <laughs> it's, it's not that Robert right. De Niro. <laughs> it's a very different Robert De Niro. And he, I like that. It, it gives him a little bit of opportunity right. to branch out. Also, the third act of this movie, in many ways, plays out exactly like Joker's third act, just so you know about that. That's why the similarities are really glaring. But what I found interesting about the movie is how it ended, right? So it's like, and that in and of itself, I think is a commentary about where society was heading at the time to which we've devolved into, right? So what happens is this person commits a terrible act. He holds this person at gunpoint. He gets himself on the air. He has an okay monologue, but because of the actions he took to get there, he becomes like an overnight household name. And then he serves his time in prison. He gets out and he becomes an American success story. Because of the actions he took to get there, he bypassed the system, he broke through. And we have to understand that as in this country, in America, we kind of like people that bypass the system and take things into your... We celebrate it. We celebrate it. it. We (laughs) worship it. Look at our president. Um, Look, Mm -hmm. really. And I think the commentary in the film was kind of a warning of which we've summarily rejected in that is... This monolithic worship we have of celebrities and and uh, how forgiving we are of the bad things that they've done to which, of course, I mean, right now in 2019, in the only immediate aftermath of what's happening with Me Too, we're only just grappling with the uh, disgusting allegations of Michael Jackson and then also uh, R. Kelly. And like only now are we beginning to hold people accountable for the truly awful things that they've done. Right. Or so it would seem. But 
this movie that came out in 1983 was telling us the entire time, hey, we're kind of got, we're we're coming becoming a society that's going to allow a lot of bad things to happen. At least that's what I took away with it. I don't know what you thought about Peter. Um, I agree completely, and I think at the end there's also. <laughs> Uh, what's his name? Jerry Jerry Lewis, who played the thing. Like he's very much someone that wants to be alone. That doesn't. He's he's celebrity. He's rich, but he's not. Doesn't seem particularly into it. You know what I mean? In in the way that um, what's his name? Robert De Niro's character Richard wants Pumpkin. to be pop, pumpkin, <laughs> not pumpkin, pumpkin, uh, pumpkin, pumpkin. Um, but then at the end, um he almost seems to be in that same phase that Jerry Lewis is. There's little hints where he's just like, <sighs> okay, you know, like yeah, he's now that he's a celebrity, it's like the, he's going to begin to realize the horrors that come along with that. Like I, did you, did you feel that? I felt like there was maybe little hints of that. And I thought that was interesting. Um, uh, <laughs> It, it's it's i think there's a lot of examples you can pull up from today's day and age where it's like you have people like on instagram or something they do like real stupid shit and then they become famous for it and then everyone talks about it and then like that's kind of what they're can we known take a time for. out take a time out and just yeah touch on that as self i guess accused millennials but we, we are millennials right you and i self-accused yeah, yeah. self-described well you were a boomer that we, we didn't yeah because i'm apparently 95 um mm -hmm. there's something to me and i appreciate if if you're not of the same point of view i feel like mm -hmm. you are though the, there's this kind of embarrassment um of belonging to uh, a generation that worships exactly what you just described and we celebrate people for doing the uh, the stupid for the most shallow reasons imaginable and they're catapulted to the tippy tippy top and, and they reap the benefits of capitalism sort of. and everything and blah 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 and it's like well I would I wouldn't I don't know if I would blame capitalism. I don't. This. We can blame it oh, for no. just no, about no, 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 no. almost everything. I don't blame that at all. I blame it on us. But I just like, I, I want to go back to the point that I was making and what we had discussed previously that when we were saying that movies are inherently political and that in instances it can put a mirror up to society. Well, here we are. This movie, King of Comedy, back in 1983 was telling us, it was foretelling us what we would become. And guess what happened? That's exactly what we became. Yeah. In a, in a lot of the worst ways possible, I would say. Like, there's so many. Like, a lot of people, and I, I want to make it very clear. I don't hate, like, the Kardashians no, or something no. like that. Like, if you can make that money, make yeah. that money, girl. Yeah. But it, but it's it's like, it is one of those things where it's like, they don't do anything. But they're famous. Like, they're, they're famous sort of for the sake of being famous. Um and there's so many people, whether you're like an Instagram star or like a TikTok star or like so many other things, YouTuber, like Logan Paul. What is Logan Paul? He just does stupid shit. Like there, there, there's not in the past what you would consider like talent. Like in the past, people would get pissed off at like, oh, rock and rollers, you know, they act so terrible. But those rock and rollers, fuck, could they play music, you know? <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Um, and f a lot of like more and more I hear like, like famous people and I'm like, oh, like, well, what is, what are they? What do they do? Uh, they're a YouTuber. They're on Instagram. Uh, uh like, <laughs> Not not to knock necessarily YouTube because I think there are some people on YouTube that are very which talented, we've said before, but yeah, but usually the people that they bring up are not those people. They're usually just like story time. I had got an Uber and it was a crazy ride. 
And they talk about how they got an Uber. And I don't know. I guess the Uber took them to the wrong place. And then that's the story. And it has 5 million views in two days. Like that. <laughs> And of course, you have other more clear examples where like um, that girl, that catch me outside girl who who like acted really stupid on Dr. Phil and everyone laughed and then uh, kind of like, oh, well, that's funny. Da, 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 da. But then she just sort of became a normal celebrity. Why? because and it's the same thing that happened to donald trump that's why i was so angry when people were like laughing at him and stuff when he was running for president like no like you're normalizing him by just humoring him in this way and then that's what happened he went from being a joke to not being a joke to being the president of the united states um we reward bad behavior uh, and I don't think it's necessarily our generation's fault. I just think it's because our generation grew up during um, the tech boom where everything got, like, as it's growing pains as far as, I don't know, the human fucking race, like, where you have to learn, like, how are we going to live now that everything is put online and we're connected in this huge way and, you know, shit comes into fashion one day and then ends the next week. Uh, but it's in a lot of ways it's helped in a lot of ways it's amplified our worst tendencies and I think this is one of the tendencies that that's bad that it's amplified I'll just say this for me I'm never an individual that you know says hurtful things with the intention to uh, bring anybody down but the way that where I come from is it's distressing to me that so many things in our quote unquote society that there's just misplaced priorities. And in talk, just about every podcast that we have, there are crises that are happening, political or, or otherwise, that deserve attention and yet are not being brought that attention. Like one of the things that you and I constantly bring up is the decimation of the film industry by the evil corporation known as Disney. It, that's a story literally every single week and yet no one takes that seriously it's just oh it's just a company being successful and that's it it's not anything more than that um and i'm just i feel that to me to not acknowledge the things that i feel are misplaced would be disingenuous to me and i think you feel the same way it's like when when people throw out that critique, oh, you guys are all so negative, and it's like, I mean, can't you guys look at it on the bright side? And it's like, I'm sorry, there's, I'm sure you can, and people can have an optimistic outlook on where we are right now, but from my perspective, everything, everything is fucked. And it's only getting fucked more. And to me, to... to pretend as if that's not what's happening would be a disservice to me <laughs> my credibility if there is anything like that and uh i don't know just being honest i don't know how you feel about that i mean you can argue that everything has always been fucked yes and, and it just yeah. it gets worse with time maybe it gets a little better da, 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 da. you know you fix problems and then you, those fixing those problems creates new ones you're in a constant state of fuckery so to speak yes. <laughs> yeah um and but i think it's important to always realize that and address it seriously and i think a lot of people do yeah don't i don't know i feel like we're jumping down a real rabbit hole <laughs> but it's I, I feel that we're discussing something that is uh, what film is meant to spark it's like film it, in a way to challenge us discussion yeah in a way to challenge us it sparks these conversations about society and everything mm -hmm. which i mean society. yes we live in a society we need a yes. society okay. counter <laughs> <laughs> how many times have we lived in a society yeah. today but this is i think the conversation that we're having is speaks to what cinema can do and i think we've said it so many times now but all of these films to an extent that we've discussed today by Marty Scorsese do that and do that in spades. Again, all of them are good to great to outstanding. 
And um, I really, really am growing to, no, I'm not growing. I, I can say it now after watching 10 of his movies. I love this director. I love him. I, I Just, he has an, I feel like we've only just scratched the surface on these, but especially on the ones to follow, there is so much commentary littered in these movies that people are years and years later only just talking about. Um, I think his films will stand the test of time. I mean, they have, and I feel they Oh will. my God, they yeah, already they have. have. <laughs> like, isn't it like, uh, what's it called? Um, Taxi Driver is like a 40 year old movie. And I watch and I'm like, fuck, this could have came out yesterday. And I considered it like amazing. The best film of the year, best film of the decade, you know, like cr- crazy. It's crazy how much um, his films can, can stand the test of time. It, they, they've, I think they've already have proven right. to. And it's like, to be fair to Marty, um, maybe he's been too much accused of being too self-centered, but like his entire stance he's taking right now is because he just wants that same opportunity for the next generation. Yes. Yeah, I think he does. That opportunity is in question, and that's the message, I feel. And I think that was always the point of his message. But people are like, you don't like my my superhero film? Fuck you. And it's like, okay, be an adult about your superhero films. Thank you very much. Understand what he's trying to say underneath. Um, yeah, I, I just from the first five films we've covered um, already, it's like this could have been the only five films he made as an entire career. And he'd already be like, okay, top tier filmmaker of all time. Um, but we still have 10 other films we're going to cover. And those aren't even all the films no, we've released. No, we're, we're covering the, the the greatest hits, I think, right? right yeah. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some misses, but I mean, just, mm-hmm. yeah. So this will be, the, to bring this to a close, the, the next episode, the films we'll be talking about are Goodfellas, Casino, Gangs of New York, and... The Departed. We'll do four films next time. Hint at the next episode. I really like all I, four. <laughs> yes. They're very, they're, yeah. I agree with that 100%. So. And what's great with all of Martin, uh, Martin Scorsese's films is he's never had to leave New York uh, his entire life. <laughs> One time. Casino. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Drove down to Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, uh, can't wait for that episode. And then the last episode, just so we're clear, uh, episode three will cover Shutter Island, Hugo, and Silence, and Wolf of Wall Street for good measure. Since you know it's there, that's sort of that the the last one feels like his uh miscellaneous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Why? Is, how so? Like you know, because they're all so very right. different from each other. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, they really are, right? So just, Shutter Island, mm-hmm. Hugo, Silence, and Wolf of Wall Street. Damn. Yeah. Those are very different films, and they're all very different from his previous film. Like, the next films we're going to talk about, they share a lot in common with the films we talked about today. Um, but with that last batch, the closest is, like, The Wolf of Wall Street. But even then, like, it, it's pretty different, sort of it's ain't no gangsters okay it's well actually yeah the worst type of gangster but it's like <laughs> it's, uh, yeah wall street so the way that we've structured out these episodes is so today we've talked about early scorsese the next episode will be mid scorsese and then the last one will be new scorsese and then that all leads up to our review of the irishman which is the brand new film from scorsese when it drops on netflix mm-hmm. at the end of the month so mm-hmm. it is interesting. Um, I believe that Martin Scorsese said that his next film is going to uh, appear exclusively on Disney Plus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man, you got me there. I, I thought you were being serious for a second. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> <sighs> That's hilarious. I'm talking that, that I'm done. Anything else to add on uh on today's show? Uh nope. I think it was a good show. Uh 
Looking forward to the next one. Oh, we should make one more announcement. Oh, yeah. What? January. Oh. What's coming back? Oh, boy. There's a lot happening in January. Oh, yes. Starting January. Like, I let me put it. Th- well, okay. Let me put it this way. I've before I announced what's happening in January, I rewatched a few of the Scorsese films uh-huh. to, to, to do all this. Right. Um, I need to watch 24 films for Kyle's. Oh, uh, Oh, for, for oh, Kyle's sh- thing. St- yes. Stop, stop. Wait. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're, oh my God. Bond and Beyond. I forget. You're on that. So yes. you have to watch 20 some movies for James Bond for the Bond and Beyond podcast, which I believe debuts January. Yes. I was, oh, okay. I forgot. I, then, <laughs> I then have 30 some films left for <laughs> this year. And then a couple more I, I need to look at for our decade um, film. So Which this, I think it's going to be the first time we've actually announced it fully. So that's another announcement on top of another announcement. Yes. So um, we'll start there. We're right. going to have uh, a best quote unquote. Well, not best favorite of the decade. Right. Top 10 um, well, favorite of the decade. One for every year. One for every year in the decade from 2010 to 2019. That will come after our uh, top 10 for 2019. Speaking of which, how so. much, what's your list of movies left to see for the year? For 2019? Yeah. I said it's about 30. Films. Okay. Um, after this, I'll probably go and watch one, one right now. Yeah. And then we're going to watch another one tomorrow. <laughs> um <laughs> damn uh so we have that i'm gonna be bringing back to the table Uh uh-huh um that but in this new version except for the first one because the first one we're gonna release i will be discussing two films we're gonna be discussing uh fahrenheit 11 9 and uh yes a year later we're gonna do it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we talked about that since mid 2018. Yeah. That yes. that particular set of movies. Good things come to those who wait. <laughs> uh, and the other film um Idiocracy. But after that I because it's it's a little difficult to get them to get films for me. I can, I it's it's I can be difficult with that. Um and I already have so many films I'm watching, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it, it's going to be me giving Kyle and Alexis a film, and there's going to we're going to release one each week. First week, you know, again we're going to be talking about Idiocracy and that. Then it's going to be Kyle, then Alexis, then Kyle, and then that's how it's going to go for uh, release that one each week for the to the table. Um, and then we're going to do have a Bond and Beyond because. I'm a good friend <laughs> and Kyle loves James Bond. Uh, we're going to be wa- January. We're going to release one a week until April 8th, the premiere of to no time to die. The, the final James Bond film for Daniel Craig and each, each bond bond and beyond uh, podcast. We will discuss uh in chronological order starting from the beginning uh two films at a time so i believe the yeah 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 right and and to keep keep uh our listeners on, on this podcast and update so what our current trajectory is we want to by the end of the month the scorsese series will be finished as well mm-hmm. as the review of the irishman for the remainder of the month i mean it's crazy so tomorrow of the recording of this date, we're going to go see Dr. Sleep. We'll have a, a podcast up on that. We also have Ryan Johnson's Knives Out. There'll be a review, a review of Frozen 2 on here. Maybe also Dolomite. Dolomite is my name. We'll, we, we can do a review on that. Mm-hmm. I'm planning on watching that very soon because uh, it's one of those films that's being talked about. Um, and if that wasn't enough for this month, we also have The Mandalorian dropping. Um, I just had to just... Are you going to watch it? Well, uh, probably because, I mean, we do the show and everything, but... Uh, Where are you going to get it? 
I, I just did a podcast that, again, uh, the recording of this date will be dropped tomorrow, but it would have already been dropped by the time this is released. So this is mm-hmm. time travel here. But I had a podcast with David, and he says he's going to probably just wait till the day that, the, that Disney Plus launches. He'll get a subscription, and then we'll figure it out from then on out how we're going to log into it and watch The Mandalorian. But I would assume that, because it is a big deal, we'll be watching that, and then we'll be re- reviewing at least, what, the first episode on, on and maybe even more uh, on uh, mm-hmm. On this show, because I mean, it is Star yeah. Wars and everything. So yeah. that's just November. And then December mm-hmm. is going to be a lot of Star Wars stuff. I want to remind people that Fantasy Fair right now is building up to that by doing a once upon a retrospect on every single Star Wars film. So that's the content going on on that. So there's a lot of, I don't know why everybody, it's so weird. Everybody decided at the same time to start doing all these different projects. And I'm like, what the fuck? Um, and that's not even, of course, the films that we have left to see for the best, the top 10 of the year and the top 10 of the decade. But then also what's, what doesn't help is that January is when Oscar season kicks in the high year. You have the Golden Globes and all the stuff that's happening. And it's like, Jesus Christ. Um, it's a freight train. (laughs) (laughs) Just a little behind the scenes discussion here. Um, November and December, I'm hoping to kick out, knock down as many of the 2019 films as as i possibly can i'm hoping maybe in december to start uh well yeah you have to in december start recording um because at least like the first month of the to the tables um and i would imagine because it's one film uh it shouldn't take more than an hour for each so we could we could not if you could watch the two films that uh, well, actually I, have, I give you three films for january because january is a long month but we can knock out the f- the first two films and one recording like one about an hour and the next about an hour so it's it, it'll be the same recording time about as uh as we do one of these and then it's also um, um it's also the worst time of the year because of all these movies that we're watching, I also like to rewatch like the Star Wars movies and some of the Marvel oh, movies. That's true. And it's like because it's Christmas time and it's like You know what? Fuck all of you. I have the most shit to watch. Yeah, you do. But I mean, uh, you know that we're going to be putting in a, a group effort here, but in that sense, yes, a group uh, effort. We'll leave it there. I want to remind all of you, you can listen to all of these wonderful shows coming to you anywhere you listen to podcasts, whether it be on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google, and even on YouTube when it comes to our case every single Sunday. And if not on Sunday, Thursdays, which I suspect we'll be uploading more on Thursdays now because of how many uh, shows we're going to make, as it seems like. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Peter, for being here. It was such a wonderful uh, opportunity to discuss real movies. (laughs) <laughs> with you here on red spotlight entertainment um keep it here under the spotlight and we'll see you next time guys bye bye